Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to the 62nd Emerging Growth Conference and day two of our two-day super virtual investor conference. I'm your host, Anna Berry. Just a few notes. Today, we're running until about 3.30 Eastern time. Now, when we switch to the next company, you might see a black screen for a moment. That's just us moving over to the next presenter. But if you do experience downtime, refresh your browser. Everything usually works properly, especially on Google Chrome. So if you're watching from an Apple device, you have to hit the play button to start the session. Now, today, during each company's presentation, you can submit questions through the webcast module and we'll attempt to address as many of these as possible at the end of the presentation. And at the end of today's event, you will be redirected to the registration page for our next conference. So stay on or come back early to reserve your spot. And all of our conferences are uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So subscribe there, youtube.com slash Emerging Growth Conference. Let's begin starting with Lisa Conti. Happy to have you, Lisa, the founder, president, and chief executive officer of Jaguar Health, which trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol JAGX. It's a commercial stage pharmaceuticals company committed to discovering, developing, and commercializing plant-based prescription medicines for urgent global health needs. Mitasi, the company's FDA-approved drug, indicated for the symptomatic relief of non-infectious diarrhea in adults with HIV-AIDS is antiretroviral therapy is a first-in-class plant-based anti-secretory agent and the first oral drug approved under FDA botanical guidance. Ms. Conti has pioneered plant-based prescription medicine investigation and development for more than 30 years. She's a member of the board of directors of Healing Force Conservatory, serves on the editorial advisory board of Life Science Leader Magazine, and serves on the leadership council of Pure Earth. She holds an MS in Physicology and Pharmacology from the University of California, San Diego, and an MBA and AB in Biochemistry from Dartmouth College. It's an honor to welcome you back to the Emerging Growth Conference. Lisa, welcome. Oh, thank you, Anna. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I love these super virtual, but I think you need two supers. It's a super, super virtual conference. So happy to be here. And let's dispense with that long introduction and get into the important stuff about Jaguar Health. We are a public company. And so we do, I do have the forward looking statements here and there we go. So I'm going to jump right into it and uh, give you a quick background for those who are hearing about the company for the first time and then get right into the important message for today. So as you heard from Anna, we do all drug discovery from plants used traditionally in tropical areas. And we did take a product all the way from our basic enabling technology, a tree growing in the rainforest, to a first in class, really paradigm shifting anti-secretory agent called Mitesi. The generic name is Crofelomer. As you heard from Anne, it's currently on the market for the specialty indication. Specialty is another word for relatively small indication of HIV related diarrhea. And the reason that's our first indication is it was specifically requested and fast tracked by the FDA. The most important thing about this presentation and about the company at this point is that Crofelomer is a pipeline within a product. Multiple patient populations that can benefit from the novel mechanism of action, which I'll go through in a moment. We can't do everything, so we're focused on two key indications right now in late stage clinical trials. One is cancer therapy related diarrhea, and that is a follow on indication, a supplemental indication to the HIV indication of my Tessie, literally the same product, same formulation, same bottle, same dose. And the second one is the rare disease indication, orphaned indication of short bowel syndrome and the intestinal failure there. So the key message for today, the only thing that you really need to remember and take away is in this really very difficult, challenging financial market for biotech companies and microcap companies. I never intended to be a microcap company is we have two major, what we feel will be transformative clinical events literally around the corner, the first one in seven weeks that translate these pipeline opportunities into revenue generating opportunities. The first one is the reveal of the primary endpoint for a pivotal trial to expand the indication of mitesity to cancer therapy related diarrhea 
who are all therapy-induced overactive bowel with secondary endpoints that include not only prevention and reduction of diarrhea, loose watery stools, but also incontinence, urgency, pain, and cramping. This is expected to be revealed in the last week of October, so literally seven weeks away, and is a prophylaxis trial for a collection of all solid tumors and all patients who are on targeted therapies that have more than 50% diarrhea, which is about 25 different agents at this point, with or without cytotoxic chemotherapy. So a very broad opportunity for results that translate into promotional opportunity. So the end of October of this year. The second major clinical <clears throat> event in 2023 is for the indication of short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure there. And we have seven investigator-initiated efforts going on around the world in the MENA region, where there is a greater percentage of congenital disorders, and there is a component of short bowel syndrome that has a congenital cause, Europe and the United States, with proof-of-concept data coming out the first piece before the end of 2023 and then within 2024 as well. With published proof-of-concept data in certain European countries, and we have established a footprint in Europe, there is an opportunity for reimbursed revenue generating early patient access while the product is going through full development for neglected needs such as the orphaned indication of short bowel syndrome and another pediatric intestinal failure issue as well. So in both, and that's a program that does not exist in the United States, early patient access, reimbursed early patient access. So in both of these situations, major transformative clinical data coming out in the fourth quarter, as early as seven weeks from now, that translate into meaningful revenue generation in 2024. And as we've looked at, you know, other companies, there's many companies, of course, in the biotech field that have, have had their valuations hit. We haven't found any comparison of another company that's had, has, that has coming up this level of, of, of a momentum event. And we're fortunate that it's happening in this time frame because these are clinical efforts that started five, six years ago. And if you look at the entire program, in some sense, decades ago. So to give you some idea of how meaningful these markets can be, if we look at cancer therapy-related diarrhea, that is the number one side effect associated with cancer therapy. It is supportive care focused on quality of life of the patient, comfort, dignity. There's also an impact on the outcome of the cancer treatment, about 40% of the time, and this is published in a paper two years ago at ASCO, patients will go off their cancer therapy or go to a subtherapeutic dose specifically because of the side effect of diarrhea. So now you're having an impact on outcome. And also it takes about three times as much cost to the healthcare system to take care of a cancer patient who's experiencing diarrhea. So with each of those pieces of data, you're really grabbing the attention of the um, key opinion leaders, of the prescribers, as well as the reimbursers. So let's look at chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That's a supportive care indication. These agents are um, taken prophylactically, typically for the first three days of cytotoxic chemotherapy, which itself will last about, you know, often six months or so. That's a market that's expected to be $4 billion dollars next year or in two years. And easily 50% of that market is generic when you think about the value calculation. What we're talking about is prophylaxis as well for targeted therapy. Targeted therapy is the you know, checkpoint inhibitors, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, epidermal growth factor receptor antibodies. These are agents that patients are on for months and years in a metastatic situation and a curative situation for the rest of their lives. So prophylaxis, all solid tumors, targeted therapy that is a chronic administration, most if not all targeted therapies work by inducing a mechanism that profelomer mitesi specifically mitigates. So we're talking about a major neglected indication 
major impact to all our stakeholders, including the shareholders in the company. And we are already manufacturing in expectation of being able to promote to this indication, this expanded indication in 2024. When we look at short bowel syndrome, that third party put that market at anywhere from five to $12 billion. That market at the moment is, uh, and so it's a classic rare disease business model, relatively small patient population, high mortality, high morbidity, high expense, activated patient groups, family support groups, good reimbursement. Um, the market there is in the market research that has put the, that type of value on it is primarily looking at a pipeline of a growth hormone approach. And there are a lot of limitations with a growth hormone approach. First, it can't be used in a patient who has cancer or cancer risk. Obviously, it's a growth hormone, a hyperproliferative situation is, an, is a non-starter for a growth hormone approach. Secondly, these agents typically can't be used until about 15 or 18 months after surgery, the surgery that's often necessary from cancer, Crohn's disease, inflammation, whatever it is that's caused the short bowel syndrome um, because of bowel adaptation, and then other toxic side effects that limit the opportunity to use them chronically, endocrinology issues, cardiovascular issues. We have none of those limitations with profilomer. So it's an additive mechanism of action. What we're looking to make standard of care into this remarkable need and, and market opportunity. So I'm going to move to a little bit on the novel mechanism of action to explain why there are so many different patient populations that can benefit from profilomer. So look at these as slices of the gut, perpendicular. And so what happens um, with watery diarrhea, secretory diarrhea, there's an insult to the inside wall of the intestine that causes an active secretion of chloride ions. So what my, my Tessie is a chloride ion channel modulator. So these chloride ions actively come into the gut, water comes in based on osmosis, second cartoon there, and then the diarrhea goes out, that's the dehydration hydration, that's the discomfort, that's the health issue. If we go all the way to the right, those little red dots, my test sacrophilomer, works locally to normalize that active secretion. It doesn't block it up or clog it up. And if the patient is normal, my test simply goes right through. So it only modulates, normalize an overactive secretory situation. And profilomer is locally acting. So there's no um, blood levels, there's no drug-drug interaction, hugely important in chronically ill patients, complicated patients like cancer patients, like Crohn's disease, short bowel syndrome, like AIDS patients. You have no first pass effect, you have no secondary metabolites causing problems later on. So what's important about my test and profilomer is what it does and also what it doesn't do. So the paradigm shift here is an opportunity to have a safe agent to normalize gut function on a chronic basis if the diarrhea and if the GI dysfunction is a side effect of cancer therapy or some other therapy, you're giving um, something to manage that side effect that doesn't itself create another side effect. So for example, we think of diarrhea you go to drugstore, you get Imodium or Loperamide. These are opioids, and they work by the mechanism of constipation. Obviously, they're typically taken after the event, not prophylaxis like ophelomer. And you can't be chronically constipated. These products are not labeled to be used in a, in a chronic situation, and they ca cause not only constipation, but rebound diarrhea. You often have to take something to deal with the constipation. Because crophelomer is not an opioid, we don't have that risk of constipation. Crophelomer is not an antibiotic, so we don't have the risk of, of uh, antibiotic resistance, um, all the other issues associated with opioids, non-addictive, non-tolerance. In fact, safety is a huge hallmark of crophelomer, quite likely because it is not does not have the systemic exposure, as I mentioned, working locally in the gut taking it orally, going through the stomach into the gut and does its normalizing action. We've never seen a side effect profile different than placebo. 
We've never had a serious adverse event with the product out on the market for about a decade at this point. So quite appropriate for this type of paradigm shifting normalization of, uh, of the patient's gut function. As I talk again, I can't say it enough, around the corner, seven weeks from now, the last week in October will be the p-value reveal for the primary endpoint for phase three trial to expand the indication to cancer therapy related diarrhea or chemotherapy induced overactive bowel, a broader collection of indications. Um, this is for my TESI. So the product's already approved for chronic indications. So we already have our chronic safety done because there's limited or no systemic exposure. The FDA has uh, not required it specifically relieved us from having to do any drug-drug interaction studies with cancer agents. We obviously have a full supply chain in place to take this product from essentially a tree in the rainforest to any pharmacy we like in the United States. So it comes down to expand the indication, meeting statistical significance on the primary endpoint for the supplemental indication. If we go to the bottom, the reason we can be precise about when we'll have this data is we have completed patient enrollment and patient treatment. We powered over 90% and then over enrolled by about 11%. Principal investigator is MD Anderson. We have the key, key opinion leaders for many of the different types of cancers. Again, this is prophylaxis for all solid tumor types. It was an international study as well, though this is for FDA approval for the United States. Um, as I mentioned, there are those studies that look at both the impact and the cost of taking care of these patients. And this is the first study where the patient voice has been incorporated in every aspect of the design, implementation, and results of this study. So the primary endpoint is based on patient-reported outcomes. Um, and we're not in working with patients, you know, in look at our advertising. They've been involved in the design, as I said, the primary endpoint, the regulatory aspects, the reimbursement aspects, and um, particularly the metastatic patient voice has become very important because 10 years ago, the metastatic patients did not survive, so the organizations were not as strong. Now, with targeted therapies, patients are living 5, 10, 15 years with cancer as a, a chronic situation, and they're not willing to just exist. They are demanding better management of quality of life. And one patient put it so beautifully, she said, you know, you can think about a, a pebble in your shoe. Could you deal with a pebble in your shoe for a day or, or a week? Sure. But you want a pebble in the shoe in your shoe for the rest of your life. And with cancer therapy, we're talking about multiple pebbles. We're talking about the diarrhea. We're talking about bone pain, muscle pain, neuropathy, fatigue. What Crofellimer can do is, you know, cancer is a pretty tough situation. We can make it a little better by removing the, the, the gastrointestinal distress and doing so on a prophylaxis basis. So as I mentioned, the on-target study is the readout at the end of October. I'm going to move now to short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure. Um, rare diseases, we have orphan drug designation, not only for short bowel syndrome, but also an intestinal failure situation, a congenital diarrheal disease called MVID, which is ultra rare. Short bowel syndrome has about 40,000 patients around the world. Um, MVID has literally a couple of hundred. And I'll leave time for questions, but I want to talk a little bit about the situation with these patients. So what happens with intestinal failure, with short bowel syndrome. Our, our intestine is about 25 feet. Um, short bowel syndrome will be five feet or less, could be as short as, as 30 centimeters. The patients don't have enough surface area to absorb the nutrients of life. So proteins, carbs, vitamins, minerals, and they often end up on parenteral nutrition, total parenteral nutrition, 20 hours a day, seven days a week. So a catastrophic situation for these patients. This can cost anywhere from $500,000 a year to a million dollars with complications that come from the ports and the infections and other complications of being on total parenteral nutrition. So what's out there now is a product which is a um, GLP 
to analog. So essentially a growth hormone, as I mentioned, atten attempting to grow the gut a bit so that parental nutrition can be reduced by about 15 to 20%. What we're looking to do is uh, achieve that same now accepted regulatory endpoint by decreasing the secretions a bit so the patient has more time, can reduce the parental nutrition by about 15 to 20 percent, as well as create better stool formation. As you can imagine, with a short bowel, it's like a sieve. What goes in comes right out so that there's massive diarrhea, as well as look at the quality of life without any of the limitations that are described in where and when a growth hormone approach could be utilized. In addition, crofelomer, there's no reason why it couldn't also be used as an additive situation if a patient is on a growth hormone. Um, the products that are out there now, this is a classic rare disease business model. They're reimbursed at the rate of several hundred thousand dollars a year. Again, the in incentives and the need for the high mortality, morbidity and expense of these patient populations this is not my Tessie formulation. It's the active ingredient crofelomer, but in a highly concentrated liquid formulation that is appropriate for the administration and the health of a, of a patient that can't take much of a gut, in, gut insult. And with the entire financial aspects of the orphan drug business model would follow in the tradition of the reimbursement that's currently available in this patient population. So because I want to leave more time for questions, um, I am just going to mention that we do have another drug approved, which is crofelomer for dogs, chemotherapy-induced diarrhea in dogs called canalevia, which is very important for the dogs. Dogs are like a sentinel out there with, with um, cancer indications. There's about 100 million dogs in the United States. 50% are going to experience cancer at some point. And when you think about that slice of gut of the mechanism of action, that could be a human, that could be a dog, almost all mammals, I think all mammals have highly conserved those chloride ion channels. So it's not only important for the dogs, but it's quite predictive, the success there that we would, will see in humans as well. We are a uh, highly liquid stock. Um, we have a lot of news and our news is Meaty. It's typically focused on clinical events. We have global unencumbered rights to profelomer. We intend to have a uh, partnership to go promote in the United States, my Tessie, certainly for the cancer situation. And uh, we'll finish with the uh, investment highlights for the company. Um, I will tell you one other thing if you go all the way down to the proprietary position. We do have about 145 patents issued, more patents filed every single day. But Crofelomer, my Tessie, is the only oral product approved by the FDA, a drug approved by the FDA under botanical guidance. And under botanical guidance, there's no practical pathway by which to bring a generic to market. So we essentially have exclusivity forever. We don't have to worry about those patent cliffs. And very interesting when we're negotiating, for example, terminal value calculations in licensing deal or business development deals. And to go up one more, the management team, we are... Ten of us have been together for over 15 years. Three of us have been together for over 30, 32 years. This is the major pivotal clinical event in this company that gives us the opportunity to bring Crofelomer to a very, very large neglected need patient population. And again, the benefit of all the stakeholders, including financial stakeholders at this time with a very depressed stock price and company valuation. So I'll stop there, Anna, and, and leave some time for questions. Great job, Lisa. We do have some questions for you. Um, let's start with talking about 2023. What are the momentum events of 2023? And also, I'm curious, what patient populations or the neglected healthcare issue specifically is Jaguar addressing? So so thanks, thanks for the opportunity to underscore the message of the of the cl key clinical events that are literally around the corner. And so again, for my Tessie, it's a product already on the market for limited market HIV. That has been important because you get all the kinks out. You know, you find out what is the messaging, what is the data that is necessary for reimbursement. We have brought in a comprehensive patient access program. So hub services, you know, anytime 
we get our hands on the prescription. We can help the physician and the patient get through successfully those prior authorizations. We have fast start programs so the patient can get the product um, well, we're helping with the prior authorization. That would be very important in the prophylaxis situation as we move to cancer. So it is that primary endpoint reveal, the statistical significance for the on-target trial to expand the access potentially of mitesi to the cancer population. And that would be um, that data in October, we would expect to file the supplemental NDA around the end of the year and aim towards access for patients for the product um, and approval for the supplemental NDA in about a six month period of time in mid 2024. In short bowel syndrome, this is a proof of concept data that we expect to have coming in before the end of the year. And then with the seven different investigator initiated efforts, some of them are physicians IND, some of them are IND, some of them investigator initiated activities throughout the beginning of 2024. And that will then focus on the revenue generation and the patient access in four European countries that through the EMA do have uh, patient access programs that are reimbursed, that are revenue generating for the company as we go through the full development program for short bowel syndrome. And I do want to mention, I did mention that MVID, which is an ultra rare disease with intestinal failure. Same thing, patients end up on parenteral nutrition you know, their entire lives. Um, that is a, an opportunity potentially to get the product on the market even faster. With an ultra rare disease, we could be talking about single digit, less than 20 patients to get approval because there's only a couple of hundred patients around the world. And that would be the same highly concentrated liquid formulation of Crofelomer different than Mitesi. Thank you for your answer, Lisa. Uh, I'm curious, what, what does targeted therapy mean compared with, I guess, traditional chemotherapy? Right. Oh, thanks. Thank you for the question also. So, you know, we all have those, you know, sort of horror movies, right, of, of cytotoxic chemotherapy where you're, you're killing the fast-growing cells. That's why people lose their, their hair, their fingernails, GI distress, but, you know, and it's typically a, you know, a six-month program depending on the type of, of tumor the patient has. But targeted therapy is remarkable breakthroughs in, in, in the care of cancer patients. There's about five, five dozen of them out there now and new ones that are developed every single day. And so they're targeted to the particular genetic makeup of, of the cancer, um, much lower side effects than chemotherapy, but in particular, in the GI area, as I mentioned, most, if not all of them, induce uh, through different mechanisms this chloride uh, ion channel secretion um, and therefore have different rates of diarrhea. There are some agents that have over 90% rates of diarrhea, and these, uh, and, and you know, grade one through four, grade one is you know, four loose watery stools a day, grade two, four to seven, grade three above that, and grade four is often puts the patient in a, a, a risk of mortality. You know, but even grade one, when you're taking targeted therapy to keep your cancer in check as a chronic situation for the rest of your life, can you deal with four loose watery stools every single day for the rest of your life? I mean, it's well, people can gear themselves up, patients can gear themselves up for six months of cytotoxic chemotherapy and then whoosh, I'm through it. But now you're talking about something for the rest of your life and it's not typically just the diarrhea, it's the other pebbles as well. So what we've heard from patients is not only the quality of life issues, but the ability to stay on their targeted therapies, but it's not just the diarrhea. By taking the diarrhea off the table, there's other other side effects that they have to manage as well. And it's very important that we don't create something to manage the diarrhea that then you also have to manage, like an opioid that would cause constipation and then you have to deal with the constipation. So we don't have that much time left, but I do want to talk a little bit about your animal business. So if you can, you, you mentioned it, but if you can uh, break that down for us quickly as we end your presentation. 
Sure. So the, the product that we have on the market now, Canalevia, is conditionally approved. That's sort of like orphan drug for humans, conditional approval under, it's called MUMS, and the Center of Veterinary Medicine for of, of the FDA. And because of the great neglected unmet need in animals, and it is just fascinating, there's remarkable analogies um, between the human market and the animal market. So, for example, 40% of dogs will go off their chemotherapy or their parents their owners choose to take them off of their chemotherapy, in particular because of the side effect of diarrhea. And that importance of not only keeping the patient on the therapy, but the comfort to the patient is highlighted, exaggerated, underscored in an animal where it's harder to obviously communicate with them about the, the tolerance that they're going to need to have, but also the whole household. You know, you can't have a dog that has, has lost control. So we're, we're so happy to be able to provide this uh, benefit to dogs and very, very pleased about the um, predictability that we're seeing to the human market because dogs not only have their own targeted therapies that are approved in dogs, but they're also using human therapies. And we do have a publication with, for example, uh, neratinib, which is a human agent for breast cancer, a targeted agent that has over 90% diarrhea. Um, with a published dog study where we had exactly the benefits that we were looking for, prophylaxis of the diarrhea, um, better tolerance of a therapeutic dose, as well as um, prevention from the animal having to go off the agent completely. Wow. Well, this is really fascinating stuff and great work, Lisa. Um, we have many more questions, but we're out of time. So we'll send you the questions. You can answer on your own. And we would love to have you back in the near future with some more updates. Thank you so much for being on our conference today. Thank you. Thank you very much for this super, super virtual conference. <laughs> awesome. All right, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with our next presenter.